everybody. Thank you for joining the most current episode of All Things Global powered by Vistatech. We're thrilled that you're here. We have a fascinating guest today, Zuren Eberhardt um, from Microsoft, who will be speaking about minority languages and the impact that they have um, on, or excuse me, minority languages and how to help them regain status and the impact that they do have uh, on our society. Uh, I'm your host, Suzanne Frank. And I'm your host, Dominica Diagostino, and this is uh, episode nine of All Things Global, powered by Vistatech. The show was created to inspire compelling academic conversations and fresh ideas for people who developed international long-term strategies. And we are so excited to have Zoran Eberhardt with us today. Zorin is a global site manager at Microsoft, and he has been working in the field of localization and internationalization for over 25 years, both actually on vendor and client side. He has held many different hats from translator to localization engineer and program manager. Uh, he has worked on many of the flagship Microsoft products like uh, Skype, Windows, and Microsoft Teams. And he has taught localization classes at the University of Washington and classes from CAT tools at NYU and Montclair State University. So before we uh, kick off our presentation, uh, just one housekeeping item. Uh, the format of today's All Things Global uh, will be a presentation. We will make sure to leave room for questions at the end of the show. And please do submit them in the chat box. With no further ado, over to you, Zoran. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, let me share my screen. I have a lot of slides, um, but I'm very sure that I will just touch on a few um, and not talk to all of them in length. Uh, it's such a such an interesting topic. Um, I had really problems just constraining myself uh, in in picking some of the interesting cases um, and um, yeah, making sure that I, I'm covering enough ground. Um, so basically what I want to start with is that uh, kind of scary statement that of the over 7,000 languages that are spoken worldwide, there's approximately 40% at risk of disappearing by the end of this century. So that's probably a statistic that some people have heard. Um, before I talk about those languages that are at risk, um, I wanna talk a little bit about language, languages in general. And it's it's interesting in our industry, I mean, we are the language industry, um, people would talk about those 7,000 languages, for example, right? That number, um, often you see even the very exact number of 7,168 living languages. Um, and um, so I will do a little detour here actually about what is a language. And we will see that resurface actually when we talk about endangered languages, because um, some of our concept of what constitutes the language, um, well, that plays a role in how we treat um, certain certain languages. So while well, you see some of the typical languages, interestingly enough, um, I have the the mapping here with a um, with a flag to the to the language, right? We know that there's it's not that easy. It's not just one country speaking one language, uh, which contributes to the fact that um, there are minority languages. Um, we see lists like this, right? The most spoken languages where it seems like all very scientific. We have those numbers. We know how many English speakers there are. We know how many Chinese speakers there are. Um, you see, um, I'm actually right now, that's my that's my course at Duolingo. Um, you learn languages, right? You see these, these language offerings. But actually, even at Duolingo, when you go a little further, um, you see languages that we might not see that often in our industry, like Hawaiian or Navajo um, or Welsh or Scottish Gaelic. Um, so there's obviously languages that are better known and there's the ones that are less well known in um, even in our community. Um, and so very similarly, when you go to, um, oh yeah, I forgot 
Yiddish. Um, so same thing, like you go to Wikipedia, you see these these languages where everybody knows, oh yeah, that's that's the language they speak in Vietnam, it's Vietnamese or Svenska, they speak that in Swedish. Um, but then we have, um, these are some of the languages that I showed at um, for Duolingo, so that's Welsh in its own uh, endonym, there's Scottish Gaelic, this is Navajo, uh, we see Yiddish down here, so um, they are all not surfacing high up um, some of those languages. Um, and then we see all these these languages, this, this is a few for, for Spain, Asturiano and Aragonese, where people actually might even ask, um, well, is that is that really a language? So I just picked the, this definition here um, from a quick web search. Um, a language is a system of communication used by a particular country or community. So country, I talked about the Swedishes, the, the Germans of the world, um, where you kind of, or for a lot of European countries, actually there's this very close association. But as I showed for, for Spain, you even have these, these smaller languages or languages that are spoken by a community within the country. So it's not that easy that you have a, a full country speaking speaking one language. So we, Going down to communities, um, and there's this famous famous saying as well by Max Weinreich, um, actually a Yiddish scholar, who said a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. And of course, um, he knew that Yiddish is still considered a language, although Yiddish never had an army and a navy, right? So um, for some languages, their status is just not that clear. And when we're talking about this, Languages that are spoken by communities, um, people often refer to dialects as maybe a subset of a language, but sometimes they refer to um, certain languages just as dialects. If you're lucky, you see somebody sees your dialect as a language. Um, so something where there's really, from a linguistic perspective, there's not that many differences. So uh, Moldovan is one famous example where um, the linguistic community is saying that's, um, well, you see the, the definition in Wikipedia is where people say Moldovan is a name of the Romanian language. And actually by now Moldova has also said, yeah, um, Basically, we can use these two terms interchangeably. So a dialect that is being elevated to a language, uh, there are some, some cases where, um, where that might be happening. Um, but much more often, individual languages that linguists would classify as, as languages themselves that are not fully mutually intelligible with other languages um, have been seen as as dialects. So one famous case is that, um, and probably more so uh, in recent years, that um, like people have said on the Russian side, then on the Ukrainian side, uh, that Ukrainian is just a mere dialect of Russian. Uh, and you see a whole list of of languages here where linguists would rather say, uh, no, we should classify these as as um, different enough where societies often would argue uh, that those are dialects. And all this basically shows, and I have a few examples where things are getting really, really blurry. Um, so um, where because of national identity, dialects might kind of, might be promoted to become more different um, and um, we are basically more for political reasons. Um, that distinction between a lang between languages is, is being made. So um, yeah, I just want to make that that excursion because I will get back to this topic that language is not only a concept by itself, not just an abstract idea, but it's heavily influenced by societal factors. So now I want to get uh, to those forty percent at risk. Um, just as my little intro here, um, 
So I, this is a slightly different number. Uh, this is from the from UNESCO. They say six thousand languages, and you can you see see again, right? That's quite a difference between that exact seven thousand one hundred thirty eight that Ethnolog had. Um, so people don't really know if you have these blurry if you have this blurriness between um, language and dialect, and you also there's languages that might have disappeared, um, but. UNESCO and Ethnolog agree that um, there's a lot of endangered languages. And um, we have some languages um, that people might not have heard of. And then there's there's languages like Swiss German, for example, uh, that is even classified as, as severely endangered because people use high German for written communication and the media often high German. So there are certain certain languages where you wouldn't even expect that they are in that in that state. So there's this whole catalog of endangered languages, and I'm excuse for the blurriness um, of this particular graphic. Um, there's so this is just in Europe, but um, this shows like um, endangered languages are everywhere. There um, and there are certain countries where you see a lot more endangered languages because there um, is also much more language diversity to begin with in in this century. So why why should we even care? That is the big question, right? Um, well, there's. Uh, a lot of things encapsulated in, in one language. So obviously each of the languages that somebody uses is um, encapsulating a lot of cultural heritage. Um, and we all know that when we learn another language that we eventually we find those, those quotes that people use or those idiomatic phrases that, um, well, if you're uh, buying a, is it a cat in the sack? I think it's a cat in the sack, right? It's like there is history behind that because people would sell chicken in a bag, and actually, instead of the chicken, they would put put a cat in there that they wanted to get rid of. And so, don't don't do that, right? Check out whether there's a chicken or just a useless cat. No, I love cats, but um, at the time for the farmer, that was not a good buy. So, like, there's all these stories encapsulated um, in in a lot of a language language, right? And so a lot of the stories don't make, I mean, you can translate stories and, um, but um, the way that stories are being transmitted orally is is in, in a particular language. And so all that, all those traditions, um, a lot of wisdom, even just in terms of the, the terminology, right? What are things, things called certain languages might have names for things that other languages don't have specific specific terms for. Um, well, there's the whole aspect of linguistic diversity. And that's um, just because languages encapsulate cultural heritage, but also a specific worldview. Um, with every language that we lose, we lose a particular view of the world. And there's also something that um, as soon as you um, understand and or speak one more language, you, you suddenly realize that there's certain things that you can express in one language that you can't express in the other language. And often it's these subtle differences. Um, all of that gets lost with every single language. Um, and obviously having minority languages and and a minority language is basically the technical technical term just refers to a language that is not spoken by the majority of the population, right? So in Spain, Spanish is obviously not a minority language. In the United States, it is. Um, so, and often it's the marginalized communities that speak those languages. Um, and the other way around also, communities might be marginalized because they uh, speak a specific language um, and maybe just that one predominantly. So big reveal, um, that's kind of the, the ideological ba background of, for me to care about languages has to do with inclusion, allowing people to have different identities and um, valuing diversity. And that's not a given. So there are pos positions when you think about languages where people say, you know what? Um, my specific language is just the best. And you cannot really express certain things in in other languages. Um, 
and that's even sometimes people even say say that about um like I have this term language snobbery here. I remember a conversation when I just started my my localization career. There was a system administrator in Germany, and he said, "You know, English is the natural language of information technology." There's just things that you cannot say in German. And I was like, I'm working on that. <laughs> I'm trying to translate all these things and we're finding the right terms. So, uh, and it's it's not true. Like if humans have a thought, they can express it. There's often this, uh, people love these lists of untranslatables. Uh, and then they write a definition of what this untranslatable is. Uh, and like, while well, you just translated it. It's, it's not that easy that you have you often need many words to express uh, the meaning of a of a specific word in a in a language, but you can translate things. Um, and so the thought that there are certain languages that are really well suited for certain things, and of course, speakers of different languages um, have declared their own language the naturally. Uh, best language, right? Um, French philosophers declare that you cannot think as logically in French as in any other language. Uh, you can only think as logically uh, as in, in French. There's no other language that, that will reach that. Uh, but the same, yeah, people would assume that English is the natural language of IT technology, right? Um, so there are these thoughts. And um, one of the thoughts that I have a quote for here is that um, People also say like just having one language that's good. Um, it will eliminate misunderstandings. Um, there's people who believe that there would be peace on earth if if people all spoke the same language. Where I would argue that there have been civil wars, uh, bloody civil wars between people who speak uh, the same language. So that doesn't really seem to work that well. But um, you can have these positions. But I. My beliefs are that um, languages, um, since they're so tied to to identity, that there's a high value in having language diversity and that um, it's actually great to have these differences. And I'm often saying that I'm so privileged working in the language industry because the problem that we're trying to solve with getting things localized is actually a beautiful problem. It's the the problem that we have differences between people. I really appreciate that. So, but as I said, language is political uh, and doing one more loop here. So that thought that if you want to be American, your identity is tied to the language. I really love the one on the very left, the respect our country. <laughs> so um, um, one example, um, and I just, Quite some time ago, uh, I remember that Super Bowl extra well because I live in Seattle and Seattle won that one. But uh, there was this Coca-Cola um, commercial where the song America the Beautiful, and I will not show it, but I have a video of it, um, was sung in many different languages. So not only in English, but also in Mandarin Chinese, in Spanish, in Keras, a Native American language. So people were really mad at Coca-Cola showing this particularly um, American song in this particular American song in in um, with different different languages. And so there's this association, right? Like uh, some of the news that I just picked up on with people like, oh, you're not speaking American, um, or this teacher in New Jersey telling the kids not to speak Spanish amongst themselves. Um, so. Um, there is this, and that's kind of like the external definition of like, you are of that identity, so you're supposed to speak that language. Um, but of course, for people themselves, they also have that strong tie to language. What does language mean to them, right? And I just showed like students walking out, they said, no, no you cannot make us um, not use our language amongst ourselves um, because that is part of who we are. And so there's this whole um, connection between language and self. Um, so obviously um, there they've has been this the famous Sapir-Whorf uh, hypothesis that 
um, there's a strong and a weak version of it. So we, I would argue, yes, we can think beyond the limits of our language. That's what poetry does. It tries to expand that. What's that's what what basically all word art does. Right? We people come up with new words for things. Um, so we're not completely limited, but there's very clear indication that it shapes to a certain degree how we think um, which language we are using. And that's uh, what also makes it so interesting when you're bilingual or you switch between languages. There's even studies around that that people make um, ethical decisions in a slightly different way when they think about a problem in their second language. Um, so language is how how we think, and it's not the only one. Um, thinking is very, very complex, but it definitely is a big contributor how we can actually um, shape our thoughts. Well, then I talked about the cultural container that is true for each and every one of us. We have this this little world where we have our stories captured, right? We have we take a lot of the um, a language's background, our community's background in that language container with us. Um, and then um, it very clearly puts us in a certain community, in the community of those speakers of that language that can be an enormously big community that uh, whatever the exact numbers might be for English speakers, but uh, we all belong that, to that community. Um, regardless of how well we speak English, but then obviously there's also the community of native English speakers. And so, um, and then people might say, hey, you have this specific accent. So uh, what community uh, do you belong to? And um, for those of us who speak languages like English that are spoken by billions of people, if they're spoken by millions of people, uh, there's probably other community markers that are important for us. But if you come from a very small community, that might very strongly overlap or be one-to-one -one with um, with a language, right? You might, um, if you come from a very small language community, that identity marker might be, might be a lot stronger. Um, and kind of how community works, um, so I, won't play this one as well, but you might, um, some of you might recognize, um, maybe you don't recognize the players, um, although probably you can see that they are rugby players. This is the New Zealand national team. And they've done that for many years. They're uh, doing the haka, this traditional dance with a Maori chant um, to frighten their their opponents. They seem to be pretty successful with that because the I think the New Zealand national rugby team has been doing pretty well. Um, so um, kind of that strong connection, it's a it's a tradition that uh, it's it's a Maori tradition. It's rooted in that language, but the whole country has embraced that. And so uh, you see the clearly non-Maori players as well uh, that are participating in that chant. So it's now uh, this part of some some of those expressions in Maori language are clear identity marker uh, for New Zealand. So um, so what happens when when languages die? Uh, well, kind of exactly what I was outlining. What languages do for us, right? You lose that cultural knowledge. A lot of the stories actually get lost. Um, you don't have those specific worldviews, um, and the more people use just one one language, you will get um, we get a much more monocultural mindset. Um, yeah, then even the um, just the the whole legacy um, of a specific language is gone. So here um, I have another another video here. The last native Manx speaker uh, language spoken in on the Isle of Man. Um, the British British Isles, um, so um, which has been documented. So some of those, um, fortunately, that media can can capture some of it. But we also know that um, just having a few records um, that doesn't keep a language alive, right? So I have a few examples um, for language 
death, but also language revival. I just want to highlight a few. Well, I want to highlight two different stories. So um, Native American languages, and it's a lot of languages with a lot of different statuses. Uh, but um, they share they share uh, a lot of things. Um, one is just uh, this is a map of the um, federal boarding schools. And I think it, the story about boarding schools has surfaced even stronger in Canada um, than in the US, basically N Native Americans being taken away, being forced to go to school someplace else away from, from the reservation and forcefully being assimilated to white society. And so they were not allowed to speak their, their language there, right? Um, so for a lot of kids, uh, and that um, went on, um, I think up to the middle of the 20th century. Um, so um, basically forced, forced language loss, right? Um, so that forced assimilation policy where people were, yeah, not allowed to, to speak their language anymore. Um, so you have that disruption of, um, basically of, of that, of traditions, right? Stories were not being told. And here you see the, uh, this is the Western United States. You see that extreme diversity of languages and you have some, you have Navajo, which is still spoken by 170,000 people, but then the numbers are going really, really low. And so mentioned i'm based in the pacific northwest so we have a few languages up here that are spoken by um very very few speakers so it's only very old people uh, and that's basically what happens languages um unless somebody really kills the whole community in most cases language death is uh means that the language is not being taught it's not being picked up by the youngest generation and um so kids won't learn the language anymore and at some point just the the remaining speakers die off so it's not uh language murder but it's really basically language extinction just because of the last um the last speakers um dying off but there's revival efforts and i will talk in more detail about who can contribute to those revivals, but uh, like grassroots language schools, um, immersion programs. I mentioned Maori um, briefly. Um, there was this concept that was started early on uh, in New Zealand with so-called language nests, uh, and a lot of Native American tribes have actually picked up on that, having language immersion in, in preschools. Um, so you see um, something as, as simple as just the, the alphabet placemat here. Uh, so um, having the Navajo words here. Um, oh yeah, I had one more examples for the, uh, this is a First Nation language in Canada, just um, highway signs. Um, so north of Seattle, I, I went to the place Whistler People might remember that from the 2010 Winter Olympics in Canada. So there's a highway between Vancouver and Whistler uh, where they have a lot of signs in uh, in one of the uh, First Nation languages of Canada. Um, so um, Native American languages, I just showed how different the numbers look like. Um, so uh, yeah, the verdict is out how successful these language revival or preservation efforts will be. For Welsh, uh, that is actually a pretty great success story. Um, Welsh was in big decline. Uh, you see the uh, Welsh not uh, word. So this is something that students had to wear around their neck when they were caught speaking Welsh in school in the 19th century. Um, meant to embarrass them that they had spoken spoken Welsh. Um, and in the twentieth century, um, so actually fairly late in the twentieth century, um, there were lots of efforts to reverse the um the decline of Welsh, and it got legal recognition. Um, 
was promoted in school, uh, more and more media outlets. Um, there's shows now um, in the UK that are in Welsh with English subtitles. Um, and this is actually one of my favorite examples for for the time when when people were working hard on getting things bilingual in Welsh because this sign here says an in English no entry for heavy goods vehicles. Um, somebody had sent that to a translator for Welsh and received the out of office mail, but they just put that text in there. They thought there was the Welsh translation. So <laughs> uh, they yeah, there was a time when they were really eager to get everything everything bilingual. Um, so the numbers, it seems like um, there's still, looks like there still needs to be a lot of work done, uh, but uh, the number of Welsh language speakers has stabilized. And um, yeah, this is a list of where um, numbers have, have grown between 2011 and 2018. It seems to have plateaued a little bit. So I've already talked a little bit about stakeholders while you saw that that street sign, for example, that's often an indicator for how minority languages are, are treated. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's just the, the mere symbolism of it where people can see when I was talking about identity, right? Seeing like, oh, I'm I'm take, being taken seriously. Um, people actually uh, see that we are here. Um, and so I, I love seeing bilingual street signs um, when like the, the one, uh, Native American ones then in Canada, for example. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's lots of stakeholders, uh, not only the government, which I have here and where we'll talk a little bit more about what governments can do. Obviously, schools and then academia are very big um, part of that. And while there's some things related to what the government mandates in terms of learning, but then there's also those additional offers, right? How much does the education system offer? Um, do schools encourage cultural exchange programs? Uh, and then especially in academia, is there other linguistic programs where people actually help um, preserving minority languages, studying and documenting them, right? And there's a lot of really strong, strong programs um, around the world. Second thing, um, big stakeholder is actually the media. I just in passing mentioned like there's more Welsh shows now uh, in the UK. Um, I think we've made progress there. Um, it's sometimes it's, it's big single events. I have this one here, um, the first Native American version of, of a Star Wars movie. So Star Wars got dubbed into Indian Navajo, a uh, really big thing um, 10 years ago for the Navajo community. So um, it can be it can be something like like this, but it can also be, um, actually I had that in the next slide, uh, something that I stumbled over when I was, um, yeah, it was a fairly recent article, Hawaii's native language. Um, and you see on the bottom of the screen, it said, read this story in Hawaiian. So uh, the author um, wrote the article in in English, but then actually National Geographic uh, went the extra mile and said, well, wow, we're talking about the Hawaiian language. So we should, probably we should also make it available in, in Hawaiian, right? And it's, it's sometimes these, um, these smaller things that are very, very impactful, right? Saying like, okay, we, we talk about an endangered language, maybe we should also um, help that endangered language with giving it exposure. And so um, there's lots of these things. Um, I mean, even in, in music, um, I know that a lot of the world likes uh, listening to songs in English, but um, it's, I have to say that I sometimes really enjoy listening to songs in a different different language and not my native German, but yet a, yet another language. Um, even if I don't understand, um, maybe I can can get the translation of the lyrics, right? So, um, and basically having more artists being exposed to a broader audience that sing in um, in minority languages can be can be a big step. Um, so now let's talk about the the role of the of the government. Well, let, let me first briefly talk about the individuals. Um, I will get back to that, but um, obviously we can all do um, 
something we can influence or other big stakeholders. Oh, that's one of the things, but uh, and support um, support efforts. Um, we can obviously just um, promote minority languages. Um, yeah, and as I said, like putting a little bit of pressure on the on the big stakeholder, the the governments. They are. Um, it's one of those things that um, if you speak the major majority language, you might just sometimes not even notice, right? That there's um, basically everywhere there's some sort of a language policy, which languages are promoted and which languages are uh, discouraged. And um, I have a few ex examples. Well, the, the favoring is pretty obvious because it's mostly the language that, well, for example, the official language. Um, we have a few examples here, language policies, how they can be very, very different. Um, like Botswana, for example, uh, highly promoting Swana. South Africa has been going back and forth in, um, in languages. Uh, Tanzania showing um, promoting Swahili. Uh, you see just the number of official languages, right? How different language policies can be. Interestingly enough, uh, it's something that um, Americans are often not aware of is that the United States doesn't have an official language. Um, There's just none. Uh, of course, people do use English. And if you want to become a citizen, you also have to uh, pass a fairly simple English uh, proficiency test. But uh, so there's actually a lot of flexibility, um, which I'm seeing in the in the US, but it can also go, it can go other way, right? If you don't enshrine um, language at all, well, then you have some, uh, yeah, when you look at, at India or South Africa, those examples where you have a lot of different languages that have an elevated status. But you also see lots of countries that have one official language and those are not monolingual countries, even if they might have been traditionally monolingual, like, uh, yeah. Well, actually, I wouldn't even know a country that is, has traditionally <laughs> only spoken one language. Um, so we know a few of the language wall, uh, laws when you're working in the language industry, right? You're probably aware of the Toubon law that um, gives specific status to French in France. You're probably aware of the uh, Charter of the French language for the uh, province of Quebec in Canada. People might be less aware of the Turkish consumer protection law. We have to have certain things in Turkish. Um, but then there's that's kind of the promotion of languages, but there's also the the ban of languages that has happened uh, in, in many countries. And sorry for singling out France. Well, for France, since they still haven't signed the European Charter for regional or minority languages, maybe it's fair to single them out. Uh, in Spain, things have completely shifted away from that, uh, from those language bans under the Franco regime. Uh, in the US, I said like no official language, but Hawaiian, for example, was not allowed to be taught in schools, uh, which definitely contributed to the um, decline of that language very strongly. I didn't, uh, so and then I have the example of, of German, where, um, which is an immigrant language in the United States where um, people were not allowed to use that during World War One. So um, now to the question, uh, kind of what can our industry do? Um, there's a lot that technology can do. Yes, um, and I'll talk about the different different areas there. So the first one is, Digital technology has enabled just preserving linguistic resources in a, in a way that was just not possible. I mean, there have been people documenting foreign languages for quite some time. Um, actually, often Europeans would go to other parts of the world and their first intent was like, oh, we need to get the Bible translated. So they would document the language, they would create uh, a dictionary and they would also create a grammar. There's quite a few languages. Um, all over the world, the Western Hemisphere, but also in India, where was actually European missionaries that created the very first um, like grammar and, and dictionary. Uh, but beyond that, uh, now with digital technology, communities can do that themselves and according to, to their needs. Um, and so um, even just in terms of recording, right? Um, it's also something that's easier. It, Bring, instead of bringing tapes when you have digital technology for doing these. Uh, so uh, you can reach more members of communities. 
Um, so that is already a great step. We can at least uh, document what is there and and help language preservation efforts that way. Um, and now we come to um, some of the technology that we are using, right? Translation platforms, um, and I don't have LLMs here, but uh, that can be tricky um, because, well, large language models, they, they are based on large data sets. And for a lot of those languages that are endangered, there are no large language sets. So scaling models that way might be tricky, but uh, like on the translation side with neural machine translation, people have developed models that actually work with smaller data sets. Um, so there are definitely steps that can be can be taken. And um, I'm actually happy about every single language that is being added to Google Translate, Microsoft Translate, of course, and DeepL, whenever I see yet another language added. Um, yeah, I think it's super, super important to do that. Uh, the same thing for apps for language learning. So I showed those Duolingo examples. Uh, kudos to them for adding some of these languages because that definitely uh, it gives those languages exposure, um, but it also helps kids who want to to learn the language if they belong to that community. They grow up with English, but they have a chance to also learn, um, let's say, um, Scottish Gaelic um, or Welsh, right? So, because I have such a plethora of, of slides, I don't want to go through all of these. I uh, just want to leave that here, like even games, video games in native languages, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, 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 for sure. I also think, Soren, the one slide where you had the uh, of the ideological background and that quote from John J. Miller um, from the National Review, I think you and I talked, you and Domi and I talked about this, you know, anthropologists say that the more we homogenize society, the greater our risk is of extinction as a, as a species. So I, I think that that was interesting, that quote, because you know, it might be more convenient for us to have less languages, but again, as an, as a species, we're all humans, we want to survive and to remove the element of Darwinism out of our language is just another step in my mind towards that total homogenization of society and not necessarily a good thing. Um, so from a grassroots perspective, though, I think it'd be interesting to understand what can we do today? Like what, what, mm -hmm. when we hang up from this call, what are some things that we can do to help this, this cause? Because I think it's, I think it's important to our, our survival as a species. Let me quickly go. I have a few slides on that actually. Um, so, Talking about the um, efforts, we can, we can. Uh, of course, there are the individual, um, individual efforts, right? Um, I mean, if you really want to take it on, even if you if you want to learn a language, uh, but just encouraging the use of of different languages. And when I'm talking about encouraging um, the use of minority languages, for those of you who have influential positions in a localization team, uh, mm -hmm. maybe root for that one additional language that a product gets localized into. Um, yeah, even even something like that, uh, but also just raising raising awareness of, of those individual languages, just making sure that we don't think about, um, that we don't think in, in those linguistic cliches, that one-to-one -one mapping, uh, be aware that um, people in Hawaii, that there is a Hawaiian language uh, and a Hawaiian Creole actually as well, kind of a mixed language, um, lots of different influences. So that, um, yeah, just acknowledge the existence of, of those different languages. And then see, um, there's actually a lot of ways to consume um, so to support media content in in minority languages, I'm, I've I've been impressed how Netflix has taken this model of just 
using the internet their their locally successful shows and then um showing showing them uh all over the world take advantage of that and uh there's there's uh movies or tv shows in uh not only in french or german but uh also there's one uh in yiddish for example where yiddish is one of the um predominant languages and just uh appreciate appreciate those languages and um I mean that's that's one of the ways that that you support them just by um by raising that awareness. Um well, what, can, what what can we do with what can we do to encourage our 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 body politic to encourage that because that that seems to be the biggest that and media uh, our media seems to be the biggest especially in America like is there anything we can do there? Yeah, yeah so in terms I of think Maybe just to add, uh, apart from those two, I think also, you know, some of the corporations, it's sometimes part of their right strategy to invest in um, different programs that could support minority languages. I re especially remember a presentation by Adobe at the previous Lock World in San Jose, you know, about all the efforts that they were putting into free minority languages to 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 help them survive. And it can be just an initiative, like a company initiative. So yeah, curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so so yes. I think that um, this, doing the product localization itself, but also um, we have a lot of technology in the language industry. I mean, when people were talking about, uh, when one of the uh, audience members was asking about LLMs, right? how can we transfer some of the models and enable, enable communities to use them? And that's, I have to say, that's one of the beauties of the digital technology that it's now being used. Sometimes you need to have those scaled down models. Um, maybe it's a, little bit overhead to, to teach everybody in the community who wants to help preserve a language, teach, teach all of them a cat tool, but can there be a scaled down version of a cat tool that people can easily use, right? So making some of the tools and processes as well available to communities that already work on language preservation, I think that goes a, goes a long way. Um, but Suzanne, to, to your question about, uh, yes, kind of how can we influence um, the language policies at large. Um, it is about um, there as well. It's a little bit about awareness. Um, I think there's that misunderstanding as well that uh, if, well, even within the localization industry, you sometimes hear people who say like, oh, everybody in Scandinavia speaks speaks English. Do we really need to localize into into Swedish? Kind of that, that what does it mean to understand a language and um, do you want to have content, although you can consume content in one language, do you still not want the content in the language that's closer to you, right? Um, and it's not all about being able to understand to a certain degree. Um, I think a lot of people can can stretch, um, but it's it's important for, for people to often to really be able to use their their native tongue, and so um, kind of getting rid of that that misunderstanding that well, even even in the U.S., right, you have a lot of minority groups where um, when you look at the census, um, the number of people that don't understand English at all is not that high. But then you have the group of people who understand English okay, um, and even for them, right, having um, and I feel like uh, the city of Seattle where I live is doing a fairly good job. I often see like just the garbage collection programs and <laughs> giving us a leaflet about like, oh, this is recycling, doing that in several different languages. But of course these programs cost something, right? And so there also needs to be the money allocated to it. And so, yeah, those are all political decisions that uh, sometimes are even, they are easier to, to influence on a more local level um, than on, on the big level. But even there, um, yeah, how, how do the language policies um, shape up in the country that you live in right what is the official what is the official policy so i would not mm -hmm. i would not, never ever support like a english only 
uh, or making English the official language in the United States, I would be very critical of that. I would say, hey, um, what does what does that mean? Um, does that come at the expense of of other languages? So um, yeah, looking both at the at the local and the the national level, I think that's super super important as well in terms of politics and policy. Well, and this this particular topic has a domino effect because it bleeds from language to culture. And I think I'd mentioned to you the story. It was heartbreaking actually for me um, when I was at Loke World and an airline pilot was at the coffee shop next to me and he was wearing a flag tie. And I was being kind of, I was actually being kind of smart. I was, you know, I think he thought I was flirting with him because he offered to buy me a cup of coffee. But I said to him, oh, you could put it in your yard and now you can wear it around your neck. <laughs> and he said to me, uh, oh yeah, isn't that cool? And then he asked what I did and I told him and he said, oh, you mean you cater to people that don't speak English? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what to say. So it just kind of was heartbreaking that somebody of that stature, I mean, we kind of revere our pilots in America and they make good money and they're considered, you know, uh, in a medium place in society. And I was like, wow, you know, how do we, how do we take somebody like that and some of these attitudes and teach and show a different way it just seems a little daunting yes yeah. yes and language you know to to what you said language is power so also how um you know with all the government policies when when something comes externally right from a source of power as well i guess there are some different considerations um on that as well and sometimes governments might tell i guess you know do more damage or harm than good uh, and i know that we we talked about some of these examples as well uh, during our sessions yeah i think it's it's super important suzanne when you talk about the the awareness right um that that aspect just being very respectful um like it's it's interesting how like the word barbarian for example comes from Greek people making fun of the people not speaking Greek because it sounds like bar, bar, bar. Um, so <laughs> not thinking about languages in those hierarchies, right? Where you just think like, oh, this is a language that nobody speaks and it's gobbledygook and uh, it's all just strange sounds. Um, I don't think that anybody in our community does that, but there's people around us that, that might and just thinking, just making clear how important every single language is, regardless of the number of speakers. It's really not um, our English and, and Mandarin, they are not inherently better uh, just because they have a lot more speakers than Navajo, right? They are both, like all three languages are languages with complex structures and they are perfectly suited for expressing thoughts. And so, um, yeah, just making sure that people don't walk around with these, these weird language ideologies um, that are often not even conscious, where people are really just, um, yeah, they're deprecating languages just because it's something something foreign. And I agree, Suzanne, that it's, it's definitely a much bigger conversation where, as I said, like, it's about diversity and linguistic diversity is just one of the many aspects of, of diversity, but uh, same rules apply. Um, respect respect for the other respect especially for those uh, that you that you don't understand in this case the not understanding is um even to be taken literally right where you don't understand the words that the other party might say uh, might, might absolutely. speak absolutely absolutely and i think we all have a responsibility to uh, try to educate our children and educate you when they're young because again this isn't just about language although that's where we can start it bleeds into culture and society and you know all the very all the way to you know how we get along with each other how countries get along with each other how cultures get along with each other i mean it just really bleeds into everything so you can see the importance of it um so i do apologize we're at about two minutes of the hour any last words for the audience from you soren um Yes, I would like to, since you asked like what people can do, um, I would invite people to look at organizations like Clear Global, which was formerly, or I think their uh, translation arm is still called Translators Without Borders, uh, organizations that support 
uh, translation into minority languages for specific causes. Uh, I didn't even have the time to talk about like um, if your language is not not understood, like in healthcare, for example, right? Uh, or people don't talk to you about healthcare in your in your language. All those specific challenges. It's getting more dramatic. If you cannot play video games in your language, um, I have this example of a video game that. Uh, in in uh, in Inuit language, I think that's really awesome, uh, but it's not as bad as when you cannot even get healthcare because people don't understand you, right? Uh, so there's very different levels of of language access, and if yeah, uh, so if you can look into something like Clear Global, uh, I would invite you invite you to do that. And yeah, there's tons of opportunities to look at at minority languages our world has become so global that um just keep this this whole topic in mind absolutely well we can't thank you enough um if you have any additional questions you can reach out to domi myself or uh zoran on uh linkedin otherwise um in behalf of vista tech we just want to say thank you should you need anything translation localization uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to Domi and myself. And we just want to say thank you to the audience for staying behind. And this has been a fascinating topic. We might bring you back for a phase two and how it impacts culture. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking with you again, Zoran. Thank you again. Thanks, thank everybody. Thank you so much for having Have me. Have a great day. Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.